Hi, welcome to my channel. I hope you're well. I've been working my way through an old school role playing game, but I'd like to take a break from that and work on creating a grid, something that will come in handy later. Also, the grid could be used for creating a game of chess or checkers. Overview. I'm going to create this program in stages. In the first stage, I'm going to create an empty window with a light gray background. In the second stage, I create a simple map to draw tiles onto the background. In this case, the tiles will represent either grass or dirt. In the third stage, I will draw monsters on the grid. My apologies for the quality of the graphics. As you can guess, I'm the one who drew this monster years ago. I was trying to make something that resembled a dog, but I fell short of that mark. In the fourth stage, I will use a mouse to select a monster and then move that monster around the grid by clicking squares that are not occupied by the monster. Now that sounds a little bit complicated, but you'll see what I mean when I do it. If I click a square that is occupied by a monster, then that monster is activated and will move the next time I click on an environment tile. Okay, now that may sound complicated, but it's really not. In the final program, I'm going to use five classes. There's going to be the class of monsters and then the class monster that monsters accesses. There's going to be the class of tiles and then the class tile that tiles accesses. And then the umbrella class of game, which has access to all the other classes. So let's do this in order. Stage one. In the first iteration of this program, we will begin with only the game class. So here's the output. What we're going to do in stage one is very simple. We're just going to create a window of a certain size and width and then fill the screen with a color, in this case, light gray. By the way, I've specified these colors in my constants py file. Let's look at the code. Import statements and constants. By the way, I've uploaded all the files I've used here onto my GitHub repo. I put a link in the description below. As you can see, we're just setting the title, how many tiles high the grid is going to be, how big each tile is going to be. Then I use these values to set the height and width of the window. Game class. The only class we are going to use in this stage is the game class. First, we instantiate the class. When we do this, the initialization function is called. When that happens, the first thing we want to do is initialize Pygame. Next, we initialize the clock. You don't have to do this, but I find it helps control the movement of pieces across the board. Sure, that won't matter to us here in stage one, but I've included it because I think doing so is a good habit to get into. Now is also the time to set the text that will be displayed at the top of the window. Here we set the dimensions of the window. This must be done before we load any images. Then we specify the color we're going to use in the draw function that will fill the window. This is the background color. Finally, we set the boolean variable to true in order that the main loop will not exit. Now that we've finished initializing the game class, it's time to execute the main function. We have already set keep looping to true, so when we reach it, the while loop will be entered. We've entered the main loop of the game. This loop is going to keep repeating until some event will set keep looping to false. After we've entered the while loop, the first thing we do is call the events function. And on the screen, you should be able to see the code for the events function. So let's take a look at it. The first thing we want to do is grab all events that Pygame detects. Then, for each event detected, find out whether it is a quit event or a key down event. If the event is a quit event, that is, if the user has closed the window, then we set keep looping to false. On the other hand, if the event is a key down event, that is, if the user has pressed a key, for instance, the escape key, then we set keep looping to false. Now let's look at the function update. As you can see, since we aren't doing anything except showing an empty window, there is nothing to update. So I'm just leaving this as a stub for now. Draw. We're almost done here. This is the last function called by the while loop. What we're doing here is filling the window with the background color, in this case, light gray. And that's it for stage one. If you run this code, a small window will appear on your screen, but that's not very exciting. In stage two, we will read values from a text file and populate our window accordingly. Stage two, the tile map. You can see the next file I used for the tile map up on the screen there. Each letter represents either a grass tile or a dirt tile and is separated by a semicolon. I'm not going to go over the import statements or the constants except to point out that I've imported OS because I will need it to read in the text file. Changes to the game class. Similarly, the initialization function is the same with one exception. I've added an object variable, tiles. This object will hold everything relevant to populating the background. Let's take a look at the tiles class, tiles. When tiles is instantiated, its initialization function is called. Here we do several things. First, we grab onto the screen object variable and put it in self.screen. We will need this object variable when we call the draw function. 
I use a list object to store my tile objects in. I like to call this inner. I will use this quite a lot in stage four when we select a monster by clicking on it. Now let's read the text file and create the needed tiles. This code is straightforward, but I want to say something about the list completion for those who aren't used to them. Here's what the completion says in English. For each element in list my lines, if this element, when stripped of end of line and empty space characters, has a length greater than zero, then include this element in the list being formed. Clear as mud? List completions are wonderful, strangely elegant time savers once you get used to them. Also, they make code easier to read. So now let's examine the second half of the load data function, where we process the data we've just read in from the file. This creates a new string every time it comes across a semicolon and puts all the strings in a list. Then, again, we strip away any new line spaces as well as empty spaces. After we've done this for this particular line, we take the list we have just created, this is the temp list, and step through each element in that list. We do this by using a for loop. Now we create a new tile by calling the tile class. We'll look at this class in a moment and passing through four values as arguments, ID, count i, count j, and element that indicates what kind of tile we want to create. Note that count j and count i will become values on the x and y axis, respectively. Now, let's look at the tile class. Tile class. First of all, I should have taken file name out. You can ignore that. Here, in the first part of the initialization function, we are storing values in the tile class for later use. Notice that what right now is in x and y is a string value, so we need to convert that to integer values before we store them in self x and self y. Here we look at kind of tile and, based on the value we find, decide which kind of tile we want to create. Right now I've just implemented two kinds of tiles, grass and dirt. If whatever is inside is something other than g or d, then an error is raised. Then, depending upon whether we have a g or a d, we load a particular tile. In the next few lines, we do something very important. We create a rectangle that describes the size of the rectangle we want. We will use this later. Next, we set the directory the images are in. Then we load the image. After that, we transform the image and set it to whatever dimensions we want. Tile draw. This brings us back to the draw function in class game. And that's it for stage two. If you're writing your own program as you go through this video, run it now and you should have a tiled background. By the way, make the tiles whatever you like. Play with the text files as well as the image files. Try tinkering with tiles horizontal and tiles vertical. If you do this, what other changes would you have to make? Stage three, output. This is what the window is going to look like when you complete this stage of the program. Class game. Everything here stays the same, except a line is added. Monster equals monsters. Let's take a look at this code. We assign surface to an object variable. We then create a list variable to hold the monster objects and then provide a variable for us to, later on, set as the current monster. Again, like before, we create tiles depending on the kind of tile indicated by the letter provided. Okay, now you can see class monster up on the screen. As usual, we take the arguments passed in and assign them to instance-wide variables. There is one thing I should say something about, why I set the increment at 0.05. First, this won't come into play until stage four, but I just tinkered around with different values and different clock speeds. Naturally, you can use whatever value you like here. If monster kind equals M, then we assign the variable monster image a value, in this case, a file name. Otherwise, we leave it empty. We've gone through this before when we looked at the tile class, so I won't go over it again here. Now we're looking at self monsters draw. That's it for the initialization function. Let's look at how to draw the monsters. Class monsters draw. I handle drawing an object in two ways. In one way, I put the meat of the draw function in the tile class, and in the other, right here, I do everything in monsters. I think I prefer putting most of the code in monster tile rather than monster tiles. That way, the rectangle only has to be created once rather than every single time the image is drawn to screen, which can be several times a second. But I'm leaving it this way for now. Down the road, I'm going to do another short tutorial on how to take the code I develop here and make a graphical interface for a checkers or chess game. Let me know in the comments what kind of tutorials you'd like me to create in the future. In any case, back to our code. After we have created my rect, we use it to blit the image to our drawing surface. Output. This is the final stage. Here's a few snapshots of the program in action. I will include a movie of the finished product at the end of this tutorial. Class game. The initialization function is unchanged from stage three, so I won't go over it again. But there are two new functions. 
current monster recorded and not current monster recorded. I'm going to come back to these functions after we go over the events function. The events function. As we will see, the xy values of our monster tiles can get out of alignment as we move them. So after each move, I check to make sure that they are integers and not float. This gives us the position of the mouse. Now what we do is run through all the tiles to find the one the mouse has clicked. Then we return those coordinates. If no tile is found, then we return none. We use the xy coordinates we find to see if there is a monster on the selected tile. If no monster has been recorded in self current monster, then we call current monster recorded. Otherwise, we call not current monster recorded. Let's take a look at these functions, the ones we introduced a moment ago. Current monster recorded. If a monster is on the tile we just clicked, then we set that monster equal to the current monster and set the current tile to none. We do this because since we changed the monster we have targeted, we need to change the tile we want the monster to move to, but only if there is a current monster. On the other hand, if there is no monster on the tile we just clicked, then we set that tile as the new target tile. Here we set the current tile by using the getTile function. I'll go through this in just a moment. On the other hand, if current monster is empty, then if a monster is on the tile just clicked, then we assign that monster to current monster. It, it sounds a bit confusing, but when you actually run the code, it makes sense. If there is no monster on the tile just clicked, then since there is no current monster recorded, we want to ignore this tile. In order to do this, we will set current tile to none. Okay, okay, that's it, it's over, that part is over. Now let's go back and take a look at get tile. Here's the definition on the screen there. This is simple, we just step through every tile. If the tile matches our xy coordinate, then we return that tile. If no coordinates match, then we return none. Now we only have two more functions to look at, update and draw. And there's the update function. The update function is where everything interesting happens. In the first line, we say that if either there is no current monster or no current tile, then we exit the function because there is nothing to update. If, however, both a current monster and a current tile is set, then we want to move the current monster closer to the current tile. Okay, so that's update done. Now let's look at the move function. What I'm doing here is examining the x and y axis to see if the monster has reached the target tile. If the monster hasn't reached the target tile, then we move the monster closer. Now let's look at the draw function. As before, we fill the screen with light gray. Then we draw the tiles and then the monsters. And finally, we update the display. And that's it. Here is the final version of the program. As I mentioned before, this can now be used to create an interface for a chess or a checkers game. Just set the number of tiles up and down and across to eight. Then use the PNG files placed in the directory marked checkers. And that's it. Well, thank you so much for listening to this video. I appreciate that. I would appreciate if you have any comments or questions or suggestions for me. Otherwise, good coding and I'll see you in the next video.